Hello, I'm Jörg Everman, and I'm going to talk about adapting the YAL workflow management system to be used on BFT blockchains. So blockchains provide two very important things. They provide transaction ordering, and they provide a consensus on that order, and they provide information integrity through their replication of storage and the block hashes. When we look at inter-organizational workflows, we need a resolution of trust issues among independent actors. In many situations, organizations have to work together that don't trust each other. And in those situations, we need to reach agreement on the state of work. So that is the activities that have been completed and therefore the set of next valid activities. So in this paper, uh, we contribute two things. We introduce a BFT ordering protocol instead of working with proof-of-work blockchains. So specifically, we're not basing this work on Ethereum, as many others have done. And the second contribution is that we are adapting an existing workflow engine to be used off-chain rather than working with smart contracts uh, and re-implementing workflow engines on-chain, as so many others have done. So why do we not want to work with proof-of-work blockchains? Well, proof-of-work chains have some drawbacks. Uh, the most significant of those drawbacks is the latency to consensus ordering. So the latency there is determined by the block arrival rate and by the number of blocks that are required to consider a transaction as confirmed. And the latency here can be on the order of a few seconds to the order of minutes, uh, depending on how the blockchain is set up and configured. Uh, equally as important is the lack of final consensus. Because of the way the blockchain works, uh, chains can be reorganized. So what used to be a valid transaction on the chain is now an invalid transaction on the chain. And the third issue with proof-of-work blockchains, especially in uh, small groups where there are very few peer nodes working the blockchain, is that it's relatively easy to attack a blockchain um, by one malicious actor because all you need is a very high-powered uh, node. Um, and depending on the context and the situation in which you use this, this may well be a valid attack vector. Uh, some of the consequences from this is that applications such as workflow engines must monitor the transaction status uh, because they must react to invalidation of transactions. Users must understand the transaction status. For example, what does it mean when a transaction has been submitted to the chain but not yet confirmed? What does it mean when a transaction is invalidated? Um, especially when a transaction is invalidated, we must consider external effects. So oftentimes, the activities or transactions that we record on the chain denote some physical effect in the real world that has happened, that, that has occurred. And while we can invalidate those transactions easily on the blockchain, what do we do with the physical effects? We need some way of undoing them. And then oftentimes, the visible state is not the validation state. For example, a user might want to submit a transaction to the blockchain, and the blockchain says, no, you cannot do that because some other node, some other user, uh, prior and unknown, has submitted a conflicting transaction first. However, this transaction is not yet mined onto the blockchain or not yet confirmed to that depth, uh, but yet the focal user cannot submit that particular transaction that he or she wants to submit. To address the weaknesses of proof-of-work blockchains, researchers have recently turned to BFT blockchains. BFT blockchains use the BFT ordering protocol and many of these protocols go back to a 2002 paper by Castro and Lizkov uh, that itself builds on some earlier work by Lamport. And the idea is that these protocols are provably correct and provably live. And the uh, safeness guarantees that they make is that they can tolerate up to F faulty or malicious nodes uh, when there are three F plus one total nodes. Now the drawback to these protocols is that they're very communication intensive. They require a secure and fully connected network between all nodes. So they don't scale very well 
between a few tens or a few dozens of nodes. On the other hand, they provide very fast consensus ordering so that we have a throughput of uh, thousands of ordering requests per second even. One particular implementation of a BFT protocol is provided by the BFT Smart Library. BFT Smart is a Java implementation and it has been proven correct and live. Uh, it has been tested to show that it can order thousands of requests per second uh, and it provides advantages in that nodes can leave and nodes can enter the ordering view. In order to use BFT Smart, it provides a very simple API. There is a client that submits ordering requests to the ordering service. Uh, once these requests are ordered, they're passed to an ordering service server that can handle these requests and um, perform appropriate actions. The server passes a result back to the client and the ordering service ensures that the client either receives a consensus result, a correct result, or it receives an error. In order to use a BFT ordering service with a workflow management system and a blockchain, we need three components. So we need the ordering service itself that orders requests. We need the block service that manages the blockchain where these requests are um, managed and stored. And of course, we need the workflow engine. Now in this paper, we make some simplifying assumption. Uh, we make the assumption that there is a block service for every ordering service and a workflow engine for every ordering service. So this is a reasonable assumption in the absence of trust between actors. Why would somebody with a block service trust somebody else's ordering service? Or why would a node with a workflow engine trust somebody else's block service? Uh, the benefit from this assumption is that we can create blocks locally because all the nodes receive the same requests in the same order from the ordering service. Uh, so we don't need to send blocks around on a peer-to-peer -peer network. The other benefit that we can get from this is that we don't need to wait for many transactions to be mined into a block because there is no mining. We can have blocks with single transactions. So the blockchain becomes, in effect, a chain of transactions. Now, a little bit of background on YAL. YAL is a workflow system. Uh, that is a reference implementation of workflow patterns. It is written in Java. It is um, implemented as a bunch of web apps that typically run on a Tomcat app server. These communicate through XML document exchange. Persistence is provided in a uh, PostgreSQL database through a standard Hibernate layer. Uh, and the workflow engine and the resource management are strictly separated. So this next slide shows the YAL architecture as it is. The user interacts with the resource service. The resource service interacts with a web application servlet API to the engine. Not, however, directly to the engine. There's an engine gateway in between uh, that passes the calls to the engine. Uh, things get stored through Hibernate in a database and back up the stack again. Now, when we put YAL on a BFT blockchain, we are guided by these principles that every participating organization provides its own node. So it provides its own ordering service server and client, provides its own block service, and it provides its own workflow engine. Uh, we further assume that every task in a workflow specification is assigned to a single node and that any resource management is done node local. So we don't have a global resource model or organizational model. Now, in order to adapt the YAL system to the BFT workflow context, we have adapted the workflow specifications. So for every task, we add a record that indicates which node this task is supposed to be executed on. Um, so we've made changes to the XSL workflow definition and we've adapted the workflow editor so that the designer can specify this. On the engine side, what we have done is essentially we've split the engine gateway. Uh, here in the engine gateway, we now intercept any call to the engine. We order these calls through the BFT smart ordering layer. Once they're ordered, we record these ordered calls on the local blockchain for the right requests or the, the calls that change the workflow state. Um, 
and then once they have been recorded we pass them back to the engine gateway and process them on the engine as normal. This next slide shows the changed architecture and you can see that the engine gateway is split into two parts with the ordering service client, the ordering layer and the ordering service server and the block servers sandwiched in between them. And we take requests that come in through the servlet API, this is number one in the slide here, we intercept them, we pass them to the ordering service client, arrow number two. Third step is the client passes them to the total ordering layer and the total ordering layer, this is the core of the BFT Smart Library, passes them to all the connected ordering service servers in the same consensus order for write requests, request that update the workflow status. These get passed to the local block service. The block service then passes them on to the engine gateway again. This is arrow number six and seven here and the engine gateway passes them onto the engine to be processed as usual. And the results go back, uh, arrow seven, um, the engine gateway responds through the block service. The block service then adds the latest block hash to the engine result, passes that back to the ordering service server. The result gets passed back through the ordering layer to the ordering service client, and then back to the engine gateway, and eventually out through the uh, servlet API as a return. This next slide shows uh, the intercepted write requests. These are all the requests that update or change the workflow status. You can see there are some requests that work on the workflow specification, so we can load and unload specifications. There are some at the level of workflow cases, launching cases, canceling cases, and then a whole bunch of operations or requests related to work items here. Now for requests that only read the workflow state, uh, the user wants some information about the workflow state, uh, there are some options. Uh, the first one is that we don't even bother with the ordering service. We just go straight through to the local workflow engine and read the workflow state from there. So that is very fast, but unfortunately it is not ordered. The second option is that we run this through the ordering layer um, and we get a consensus result uh, but not necessarily an audit result. So BFT Smart has the option of not having to order requests. Uh, the benefit of this is that we can detect whether the local engine is faulty. So we can compare the local result to the consensus result that comes back from the ordering layer. Uh, the third option is that we can order these requests and we get a consensus through the ordering layer. And the benefit here is that we avoid inconsistent reads. So for example, let's take a write request and a read request, uh, both coming in close together. If we run the write request through the ordering layer and the read request goes straight to the engine, it may well be that the read request is executed or the results are read before the write request is executed. So we get a dirty read that way. And by running it through the ordering service, we can exclude this. So here's a table of uh, all the different read requests that we can intercept here. One aspect that's always problematic on blockchains is time, because the different nodes don't necessarily have synchronized time. So how do we deal with this? Well, time comes in in three different uh, aspects here in the YAL system. Time is recorded in work item records. For example, the engine embeds timestamps when a work item is started or when a work item is enabled. So when a work item is created by the engine, we pass the work item record back through the ordering layer. Um, the results from the different nodes will of course not be identical. So that makes it impossible to achieve a consensus result. So what we do instead, we intercept this uh, result, we strip it of the timestamps, we pass it back through the consensus ordering layer and then we insert the timestamps from the local engine. So that's the best we can do there. Time comes in for timer tasks. So timer tasks are done uh, through a work item timer object. And we've adapted this work item timer object to call the engine gateway rather than the engine directly once the timer expires so that we can intercept the call and then proceed with this call 
as normal. Uh, and in a similar way, we work with delayed case starts. Those are handled by a launch delayer object that normally calls the engine directly, but we've changed that to call the engine gateway. So again, we can intercept that and handle those requests in the same way as we would normal user requests. To ensure that work items can only be operated on by the node that they are destined for, we have adapted the announcer object. The announcer object is used by the workflow engine to announce events to registered observers, such as the resource service. And the announcer object uh, ensures that only those events are announced that are relevant to the local nodes. So here, the following table there shows some events that are globally relevant and then some events that are only locally relevant. And when a request comes into the ordering service client and the ordering service server, we again check whether the node that makes the request is actually allowed to make that request. So for example, a node says, I want to notify a work item completion. Uh, then we check whether that work item was actually uh, destined for that particular node. So this approach has uh, some limitations. Uh, some of them may be serious. Uh, one of the things that is troubling is that the workflow engine cannot easily be recovered. If the local blockchain or local node is faulty, we need to recover the workflow state. And unfortunately, because of a lack of undo or a lack of checkpoints in the engine, that means essentially we start from a blank state and play back all the past transactions that are on the blockchain. Uh, another limitation is that we don't have a global organizational model, so we can do resource assignment only for a single node. Uh, and because of the nature of the BFT algorithms, the scalability is limited, as I mentioned earlier. We are looking at a number of future extensions, and because our system works at the level of the workflow engine or work item lifecycle to be specific, uh, rather than at the level of um, workflow modeling notations or workflow uh, modeling specification languages such as BPMN, uh, it is relatively easy to integrate different workflow engines as long as we can map the work item life cycles to each other. So one of the things that we're looking at is another open source workflow management system, the Bonito workflow system, to see whether we can integrate that uh, workflow engine in a similar way here. So to summarize, um, our work here has addressed many of the weaknesses of proof of work based systems. Um, it's an architecture that we have not seen with an existing off chain workflow engine. Uh, and because of the way the BFT workflow system behaves, it looks and feels to the user like a traditional workflow management system. There is no latency. Transactions are immediately confirmed. Uh, they cannot be invalidated again uh, as you would have on a proof of work chain. So neither the workflow designer nor the user need to monitor transaction validity, need to monitor the transaction state here. Um, and we get the benefit of greater throughput as I said, on the order of uh, hundreds of transactions or requests per second. So especially for fast moving workflows, that's a significant benefit there. Thank you.